World Famous Volcanoes, Part 6, Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument. Mount St. Helens in southern Washington once towered to 9,677 feet, a nearly perfect cone in the Cascade Range. The line of Cascade Mountain volcanic peaks stretches from southern British Columbia in Canada to north central California. After lying dormant for 120 years, the volcano rumbled to life with earthquakes on March 20, 1980. More earthquakes and eruptions of ash and steam followed, and a bulge grew on the mountain's north slope during the next two months. Then on May 18th, a massive explosion destroyed the mountain symmetry. In less than 30 seconds, St. Helens' top and north side were ripped away, leaving an unevenly truncated cone 1,313 feet lower than the original summit. A blast of hot air and gases leveled the trees in its path and seared others as far away as 23 miles within five minutes. An avalanche of more than a half cubic mile of debris roared down the mountain slope at more than 200 miles per hour and poured into the once pristine Spirit Lake raising its level by 200 feet and leaving its new shoreline a barren wasteland. The May 18th eruption leveled more than 150,000 acres of forest, mostly north of the mountain. Landslide debris and mud flows inundated the north and south forks of the Toodle River to the northwest and west. Mud flows also extended along streams to the southeast. 57 people died, including campers and loggers, along with scientists and photojournalists who were monitoring the mountain. Today, the devastation zone and sites related to older volcanic activity in the area are contained in Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument, a 110,000-acre preserve established in 1983 and administered by the U.S. Forest Service. Paved roads provide access to some parts of the devastated area. Interpretive signs explain the various aspects of the eruption that scoured the forests and several of the river channels that emanate from Mount St. Helens slopes. Displays of the destructive force of the eruption may be seen at the U.S. Geologic Survey offices in Vancouver, Washington, and in a U.S. Forest Service interpretive center at Toledo, nearer the volcano. The Geologic Survey offices in Vancouver are also the center for the continuous monitoring of the active volcano. Seismographs record frequent tremors from the mountain. Scientists from other volcanic areas, such as Japan, frequently visit the Vancouver Center to learn more about the geologic processes that affect their homelands. Visitors to the National Monument find the sites of Mount St. Helens eruption events well marked. This area, along the upper channel of Muddy River, southeast of the peak, was covered by a type of volcanic mud flow known as Lahar. Scenes such as this were left in the wake of the initial blast on May 18th. Masses of sand, gravel, and rocks saturated with water from melted ice and snow surged down the mountain slopes in several directions at great speeds. The Lahars followed stream valleys that had been carved by glaciers on the slopes of the mountain. These streams were quickly filled to overflowing. Thousands of trees splintered under the force of the onrushing mud flow. And sheared off logs were carried great distances. 
the force of the flow embedded stones in the trunks of some trees. The muddy river channel reveals layers of volcanic debris laid down during Mount St. Helens' 40,000 year history of eruptions. Occasional puffs of steam, reminders that the nearby mountain is still active, can be seen rising above the southeast rim of the eruption crater when clouds clear the summit. The Lehar reached this point approximately five miles from the mountain in a little less than four minutes. Vegetation is beginning to return to the barren surface of the mud flow. A young fir seedling has taken root, and some thoughtful visitor has attempted to shield it from harm. Farther downstream, the Lehar inundated the main channel of Muddy River. The mud flow was more contained in the broader channel of the now larger stream. Much of the original flow has been eroded by the continued course of water through the river. North of the Lehar area, the effects of the initial hot blast of the eruption can be seen on the eastern edge of the devastation zone. Slumbering Mount Adams, another volcanic peak, rises approximately 35 miles to the east. Down trees crisscross the slopes of the clear water valley like layers of giant toothpicks. These weathered signs indicate that many of the larger and more accessible of the down trees in this area were salvaged for lumber production. Prior to the eruption and the establishment of the National Monument, some of the land around Mount St. Helens was privately owned and surrounded by Gifford Pinchot National Forest. Many dead but still standing trees were cut, so stumps dot the pumice-covered landscape northeast of the mountain. As in the Lehar areas, geologists can trace the eruptive history of the volcano in the layers of ash and pumice. While the landscape remains barren, life is returning. This first seedling will draw its nourishment from the rich volcanic soil. Eventually, the devastation zone may again be covered with towering trees characteristic of the area. An example of the dense forest that covered the area north of Mount St. Helens is preserved in the Quartz Creek Big Tree Interpretive Site, a grove of old-growth Douglas fir and western red cedar less than a mile from the devastation zone. The delicate plants of the rich forest floor are sheltered by the trees. It was an environment similar to this that attracted three campers to what was the cool seclusion of Ryan Lake the weekend of the eruption. One man died as the blast swept over the lake, and another was killed two miles away where he and his friend had ridden horses. The horses and his friend dead, the third man hiked back to Ryan Lake, but he died of asphyxiation five miles beyond the lake, attempting to hike to safety through this devastated landscape. The blast was channeled by the ridges of the contorted landscape north of Mount St. Helens. Slopes remain littered with downed trees. As the gases cooled and the force of the blast dissipated, the forest remained untouched just beyond the seared trees. Subsequent ash falls caked some of the landscape, but the abundant precipitation around the mountain is rapidly eroding the crust. Here too, life is returning to the blast zone. 
The main visitor area in the blast zone is on Windy Ridge, less than four miles from the crater. During the summer season, rangers give interpretive lectures here overlooking Spirit Lake. Beyond Windy Ridge, access to the volcano is limited. Dramatic evidence of the direct force of the eruption blast can be seen in this restricted area. These ridges were swept nearly clean of the downed trees. The timber was dumped into Spirit Lake. Much of the lake's surface remains covered by a solid raft of logs. Beneath 200 feet of debris near the south end of Spirit Lake lie the remains of Harry Truman and the fishing lodge, which he refused to leave despite the threatening volcano. The active crater of Mount St. Helens looms over the landslide debris flow. Boulders and pyroclastic fragments of all sizes offer geologists a sample of the material that was ripped from the mountain during the eruption. Less than three miles away, the amphitheater shape of the eruption crater can be seen clearly. Its jagged south rim rises approximately 2,000 feet above the crater floor. Occasional puffs of steam rise from the crater. These emanate from a growing lava dome that protrudes in the center of the crater. The dome's seething surface is the most active feature of Mount St. Helens as it continues to change. Scientific instruments keep a constant watch on the restless mountain and visitors witness the constant change of the volcanic landscape. 